Hey friends, welcome back to another episode of the Influential Motherhood Podcast. I'm your host, Melissa Duncan, and as a mom and lawyer, I want to be a cheerleader for moms who don't want to give up their own goals and dreams. Around here, we celebrate moms who are making a difference and talk about ways to juggle work, motherhood, goals, faith, self-care, and more. I'm so glad you're here. The only filters we use around here are coffee filters, so pour yourself a cup and enjoy the show. On today's episode of Influential Motherhood, I'm here with Hillary Wilkinson, and Hillary is a mom of two and has a background in, I believe, psychology and a master's in education. Is that right? Correct. Correct. Very As good. well as a teaching credential. I was in the trenches for Very several good. years. In the <laughs> trenches for sure. Um, so Hillary is on the board of the nonprofit Healthy Screen Habits, and so she's here today to talk with us about how we can parent uh, best in our very digital world that we live in now. So Hillary, thanks for being on the show. Thank you so much for inviting me. Yeah, it's right. certainly a topic that I think every mother of our generation is dealing with. So absolutely. It's an absolutely. important one. Very important. So before we get started talking about healthy screen habits and all the amazing tips that you're going to have for us, tell us just a little bit more about you and your family and then how you became involved with healthy screen habits. Well, great. Okay. So like you, you kind of gave my credentials, my background and healthy screen habits really came about as it was kind of, you know, I'm never underestimate the power of a small group of people, you know, yeah, <laughs> going absolutely. back to Margaret Mead. <laughs> but uh, it was a group of moms of varying professions. And it seemed as though every time we met, all of our kind of like, you know, you share your celebrations with your friends, but also when you share kind of your concerns or maybe your struggles, we started noticing a common theme with that. And that mm -hmm. was like this kind of this nucleus of screen time. And it just seemed that all of us were struggling in varying ways. And it wasn't the same in every household, but it did seem to have this common theme of going back to our digital lives and how are we managing our digital lives and our digital landscape. And so that's really how it got started. I've, I've got a great group of ladies who we founded this organization and currently we're giving talks at uh, schools, church groups, community groups, we'll travel, what we'll podcasts, been on TV a couple of times. It's, I love it. Uh, yeah. I yeah. Love that. Yeah. Well, you know, what's interesting to me is you think, okay, this is, you know, a relatively new nonprofit. And at the same time, though, these are relatively new issues, because our generation was not, you know, screens weren't, screen time wasn't something that we had, that our parents had to necessarily deal with and think about. Um, right. And I think that, therefore, I think it's great that y'all are reacting to what we're seeing in terms of technological advances, especially because it's happening so quickly. Yes. And kind of infiltrating our families. <laughs> yes. And Melissa, I think it's important to remember that not only are we the first generation of parents who are kind of navigating these digital waters, mm -hmm. we're also, we are the last generation who is going to remember the before. Oh, that's and a great point. Thank you. And it's it's quite critical because we always want for our kids the very best of our own childhood. Yes. If you think about like, you know, your holiday traditions or even, oh, Sunday night movie night or whatever, you right. kind of reflect back on it and you think, oh, I want to recreate this for my kid, you know, for my child. Yeah. And, and we are going... To, we are the last generation who is going to be able to remember what it was like without the screens. So it's important that we pass along some of that knowledge to our kids. And, you know, unfortunately, there is a large segment of children who have come up through the trenches mm -hmm. and it's kind of gotten in front of us and we're seeing staggering statistics of depression, anxiety, suicide ideation, and horrible effects. And we just kind of want to really make sure that when, as we invest our time, it seems that so much more of our time is getting invested into this digital world. Like we really want to reflect on what are we getting back from that? Yeah. Yeah. And I think as parents, I know at least for me, I'm still trying to navigate how 
I use technology in front of my kids yes. because it is so accessible to me and it really makes my life easier in a lot of ways. Oh, uh, technology you know, is amazing. It, it is I, amazing. You know? Yes. Yes. <laughs> no, I, we, I, it's go just ahead. something, no, I was just going it, to, it's something that I find ways to communicate with family members and people at work you know, not a lot, but it's something that they, I don't have to spend time on the phone. They can text me and I can respond quickly or I can work on my grocery list on my, on an app on my phone, or I can Google our meal for, you know, how to make the meal that I'm planning on making that evening or how to put something together or but make, travel, afraid, plans, or make or, travel plans or plans. Yes. But what my kids are seeing is me in front of the screen and I don't know that they can really put their minds around what I'm doing on the, on the screen. So you're so smart to oh, recognize <laughs> that. You're so smart to feel those like blinking lights and that danger, danger warning sign because pay attention to it. <laughs> okay. Yes, and what you need to do is you need to be very transparent in front of your children mm-hmm. about what's your purpose. Why are you engaging with technology at that time? And I, I have to, I have to warn you that, you know, it will it will come up when you start to say my I'm using my phone for and then you're realizing oh I really don't need, uh, at least if you're me you know right, oh right. I I just want to check Instagram I'm, not, <laughs> I'm guilty know. yes yes no it might it might be something like that but it as a result it kind of it's kind of analogous to keeping a food diary to keep track of your nutrition mm. you know where you kind of you're just keeping track of what you're doing you go okay so I'm using my purpose for using technology is and when you make that very transparent to your children then they're kind of brought into that world because one of the things you don't ever want to do is you don't ever want to create a scenario in which the box or the device is the most important thing in the room particularly in front of your children and that is the implicit message that we send and you, I mean, you can picture the scenario in your head where you're standing with a friend on the sidewalk, maybe after school drop off, you're sitting there, you're talking, talking, talking. She gets a notification of something. She whips up the phone or he, um, you know, could be yeah, a dad right, doing drop right. off, but whoever, whomever it is gets a notification, whips up the phone and suddenly all the conversation goes silent. Mm -hmm. And everyone defers to the device. Everyone (laughs) cricks, makes the device the most important thing in the relationship at that moment. And that's something that I think we're doing a good job of realizing, wait a minute, this is not the message, much less the implicit message that I want to send to my children or my family, that any of these plug-in things are any or take precedence over this eye-to-eye, face-to-face relationship. So when you do that, when you set up that boundary of I'm using, I'm using my phone to, you know, then they know. And it also keeps, it make it keeps you honest. Yes. <laughs> On, well, oh. I think that's so important because it is easy to just kind of say, you know, okay, I was on, you know, on Google looking at the recipe, but now all of a sudden I've, I've somehow landed in Instagram and uh, things have gone awry pretty quickly, you know, oh, in terms and of. It is designed to do that to, to do you. That. Yes. Know, no, I the know. algorithms are real. <laughs> the, oh. It is designed to tap into these little dopamine hits. Dopamine's a neurotransmitter in all of our brains that neurotransmitters are little chemical messengers within our brains that are kind of like delivery devices Mm -hmm. for feelings and emotions as well as other things. But dopamine particularly is the neurotransmitter that engages with feelings of, of craving and wanting and anticipation. And it also has good things. I mean, which can all be good things. They, it's also focus and attention and things along those lines. But we're, we're kind of being manipulated. Our brains, our little organic brains kind of got hacked a bit in that the digital platform took, you know, just as the digital platform was exploding in its own, you know, 
map of technology growth and um, all the amazing things that you and I just talked about, it also was expo- the the technological platform in other areas were exploding, like in the areas of medicine and science mm-hmm. and neurobiology. So it didn't take too long for the neurobiologists and to the you know their information, what they were coming up with. We now have the ability to tap into what's in, going on inside of our skulls and see what areas of the brain are being lit up and what's happening when we're doing this. It's all super amazing, fantastic stuff, but it can also be manipulated in ways to create something that, you know, is very difficult to ignore or put down or, or any of those things. And that's kind of what we're seeing as a, when you talk about somebody who's being, you know, quote tech addicted or something like that is it, it really is that serious. Yeah. Yeah. That's scary. That is. And especially as we think about these little brains that are so manipulated, you know, easily manipulated. Oh my gosh. Particularly in childhood. Yes. There's an amazing website called the center for humane tech that was started by Tristan Harris, who was an ex Google ethicist. He did an amazing Ted talk on persuasion labs Mm -hmm. in Silicon Valley. And he was one of the first, I would say like, um, going to use the word whistleblower of Silicon Valley to help us understand that it's like, oh, there's a reason why you're up at 2 a.m. and can't turn away from the glowing light. You're not going crazy. This was designed to do this. And so, yeah, it is. But, But it's one of those things that when you start knowing the mechanics, then you can put in things like stopping cues, which are signals for yourself that will enable you to shut something down and go, okay, I've had enough. You know, you can manage your time limits and we need to be doing that for our kids too. Absolutely. So at the beginning, you mentioned reference of the statistics that we're starting to hear. And I've heard this as well. Uh, And I work with law students. So I work in in higher education, uh, but with, you know, an older crowd, but they are still uh, technology or digital natives, I guess that's the, the yes. right word um, yes. as a generation. And at the same time, though, you know, I'm hearing statistics on the news about the increasing statistics around mental distress and suicide ideation and stress and anxiety. And we're I'm hearing statistics around that, especially with the preteen and teen and young adult populations. And that's really, really scary as I have two little boys who are now starting to grow up and get a little bit older. So can you talk to us about, uh, you know, a couple of those statistics and then why that's happening and how it relates back to technology and screen time? Sure. Okay. So when we are talking about the statistics, the easiest trends to look at actually are in the years from roughly, let's go the years like say 2000 to 2016. Okay. So pre 2007, we were actually seeing a downturn in the teen suicide spike and as well as uh, what are called major depressive episodes. Mm -hmm. A major depressive episode is a depressive episode that lasts two weeks or longer. And, and uh, we were seeing kind of a downturn in that it was looking great. And then boom, right around 2007, you start seeing a a sharp spike up and you go, Hmm, that's interesting. And then from there, it just climbs and climbs and climbs. Now, knowing all of that was going on, there's a researcher out of San Diego State. Her name's Jean Twingy. She's the author of the book iGen. She took data from countless sources, went through social indexes, created research of her own, etc., to find out like what is going on. And honestly, the thing that she found that most closely correlated to those numbers, remember that number I told you 2007? Mm-hmm. That was the year the iPhone dropped. 
Okay. And when you start seeing the extreme spike again was in 2012, which 2012 was the tipping point at which over 50% of Americans now owned smartphones. Wow. So there is a distinct correlation. Now, I'm not saying that the device is responsible. You know, all along that time, what was being developed was social media Mm -hmm. and all the uh, variants of other technologies that are coming at us but the uh, the smartphone really changed the way we interacted with technology it made it so portable so so i mean it's it's created its own language even yeah. there's there's the phrase nomophobia which means like the, the fear of being without mobile oh, service so yes it's um i mean there's it there is i mean there are people who are will t- after leaving their house, will turn around and return to the home to make sure they've got their phone after, mm-hmm. you know, I mean, it's something that we all kind of relate to, particularly if you're, I don't know, an anxious mom with somebody at school, yes. <laughs> and you're yes. always waiting for that phone call. You're yes. always thinking, okay, okay. You know, I mean, and it's, I, I mean, it's just, it made a difference in the way that we interact with technology and it also just increased this level like I said that level of anxiety where we feel like we've constantly got to be checked in we've constantly got to be dialed in and those levels are are increasing all the way in our organic like I said in our organic brains and our in our uh, physiological makeup that it was uh, we were not designed to be this yeah. stressed all yeah. the time. And so what you're seeing is kind of the fallout of that. The, the way that we need to approach mitigating this is we need to be providing kids with what I call kind of a reservoir of self. Mm-hmm. And what that reservoir looks like is it's a way that you know how to take care of yourself and your feelings without turning to a digital distraction because currently what's happening is as soon as uh, somebody a child is in distress or uh, somebody who has a device is is uncomfortable in distress we have this easy distraction mechanism Mm -hmm. we just pull it out and start flipping through the pictures right Mm -hmm. and it well although it provides a distraction it may it may stop you from you know from falling off the ledge it does not take you from the ledge so it provides distraction but it does not provide it does not promote well-being and so we need to look at those things and they typically you know come through our outside world. They come mm-hmm. through mindfulness. They come through physical touch. They come through relationships. So we need to be spending more time with our kids in intentional manners so that when they're having a bad day, they know how to react. We need to increase their emotional intelligence. Mm-hmm. And Dan Siegel is a researcher out of UCLA. He founded the um, Mindful Awareness Research Institute, and he is also an author of uh, several books. He talks about teaching kids, you've got to name it to tame it. So you to first, when you're dealing with little guys, I know you've got a preschooler. So when you're dealing with preschoolers, one of the things you want to deal with is you want to talk about emotions and talk about when, when you feel a certain way, like give them the words for it so that they can communicate those feelings and teach them from there you go and you, you build upon that and you teach them, well, so I'm going to use the example of when I cry, I feel sad. Mm -hmm. I need 
What do you, you know, and then you need to, ta- you can talk with your child. What do you do oh, when you're, great. when you feel sad, what do you need? You know, mm-hmm. and it's going to, v- sometimes the answers will surprise you, but sometimes it will be something more that you'll expect like a hug, you know, yeah. but yeah. then also you lead them down the path of when I hit, I feel you know, what's, what's the, what's the emotion that goes with that Mm -hmm. action and what can you do then, or what do you need? And so we're teaching them how to name their emotions so that they can then learn an actionable thing that will help them tame it. So like I said, we're increasing emotional intelligence and in doing that, you're creating more empathetic children. Oh, that's great. And that is so key. Yes. There's a, a beautiful book out called Unselfie by Dr. Michelle Borba, who talks about the importance of creating an empathetic child and this whole what what they're what sociologists are calling the empathy gap that we're seeing in this you know uh, narcissistic based culture that we have where somehow it's become more important to be famous than to be good mm-hmm. and to be kind. And we want to, we want to really look at the, at the, I'm not going to get political, but we really want to look at our political climate right. and decide what types of leaders do we want moving forward. Yeah. And in my, my vote for humanity is, Absolutely. Is, is, you know, what carries with that. And to do that, we really need to have kids who are going to be able to relate and care and, you know, be kind with one another. Yes, so great tips thank and something you. that I think applies to any age, because I think that you could teach a three-year-old to think through those questions and and their responses. And then we can apply that to teenagers and young adults and even probably some parents who might feel like they're addicted to to their phones. Um, Yes. So you mentioned the parent who would turn around and come back to be sure they have their phone because they fear that they might get the daycare call. And I've definitely been known to do that, you know, to, oh. to, to you, come back. And, do you and, know how I came up with that? <laughs> like, do you know how I came up with that example so fast? Yes. yes. So, but you know, I, I'm in a lot of mom groups online and this isn't a challenge that I have yet, but I think some of my audience has this challenge and I see a lot of, parents asking each other this when they have late elementary school age kids, middle school age kids, this question of when is the right time to get a phone for my kid for safety reasons? Oh my gosh. So that is like the question of the age, right? (laughs) And of course the kids want the phone because all their friends have them. Of course they do. We live in a I think some scary times, you know, with with school age kids too. And so the parents want the kids to have a phone. So walk us through some considerations that parents can think through when they're deciding the right time for their kids. Certainly, certainly. Okay. So one thing to let you know is that uh, at Healthy Screen Habits, we definitely promote the wait until eighth campaign. Okay. okay, which is a national campaign. You can sign like a petition online. It can all be very official. But when you do this, it's important to talk to your child why. Why mm-hmm. you think, you know, one of the things that I do think our generation has done a very good job of is, uh, l- let me back up a little bit, Our our uh, the kids that we are raising today have no shortage of information at all times. And in knowing that they have no shortage of information, what we have realized we have to teach them, our educators and our, you know, to to move forward into the next step, what we have to teach them is critical thought. So what the, you know, quote unquote, lovely thing with teaching Mm -hmm. critical thought is we are raising a lot of questioners. And it is really exhausting to be raising a questioner after you have been put in a full day and you are trying to remember why did I decide that and now I'm being challenged and, Mm -hmm. you know, so it's just, it's good to remember 
that you're raising a critical thinker. So, so when you, when you're getting all the why, why, whys and the, and the pushback, just remember that these are traits that you really actually very much want. (laughs) And so, so you do want people that are going to know why they're doing what they're doing. And so, Getting back to the technology side of things, the, we support the Wait Until 8th campaign. There is a variety of resources online. Uh, one of the ones that comes to mind is there is a great website called Better Screen Time that's run by Andrea Davis, and she has put together a great checklist that allows the child to go through and do a self-inventory of, like, just kind of taking taking inventory of their own responsibility. It asks questions like, do I take care of pets? Do I do my homework? Do I do my homework without being asked? Do I, you know, I mean, do I empty the dishwasher mm-hmm. without being asked? So it really causes the child to kind of sit and reflect and go, okay, if I'm not doing these things, then clearly... You know, I mean, it it becomes a black and white issue, which is, are you responsible enough to handle this or not? Yeah, that's great. Now, and then she all, they also have a four step plan that kind of walks you into a smartphone, Mm -hmm. starting with a flip phone. But that being said, there's some great technology that's coming out on the market now. Well, the first one that comes to mind is Gab Wireless, and they have just come out with a phone that looks like a smartphone it's got the touch screen it's got everything it mm-hmm. can take pictures it cannot send pictures it cannot oh. receive pictures I they can that. yes they can text only they can i mean there it can be used as a phone or it can be used, but it doesn't have the you know the the kind of stigma attached with a right. with a, a brick phone or a flip phone yeah. <laughs> so so there are there are alternatives out there okay That's if you great. and you said that was called gab wireless correct if you okay. log on to our website at healthy it's www.healthyscreenhabits.org we're working to set up an affiliate link with them because we so support what they're doing they're just they have taken what every mom want what every parent wanted and they created it so we are so are thrilled That's that fantastic. it's being yes yes That's that it's Fantastic. being made available. Wow, yeah. I love that. So as we are seeing kids be, uh, be use more technology, because you and I were not using smartphones or flip phones even yes. know, in eighth grade. So yes, we're, I think I was in college maybe when I got my first cell phone. And so as we're seeing kids using technology earlier to communicate in more often that way instead of with face-to-face interactions. I know the impact I'm seeing at the young adult level in terms of not being able to just pick up the phone and make a cold call. <laughs> oh, uh, you know, that's yes. something that we're we're having to really teach and are kind of realizing that's something that has to be taught. But what impact does this new type of communication or you might say lack thereof have on kids at a much earlier stage in terms of preschool, maybe elementary school with their learning and speech development? Oh my gosh, I'm so glad you asked about speech. That is one area that honestly, educators, I, when I talk to preschool and kindergarten teachers, mm-hmm. the rates of speech of speech delay referrals are soaring. Wow. And so let me let me kind of back it up and um we'll go to what would be called like a speech emergent child. So I'm talking about your classic, like neurotypical 18 to 20 month old. Okay. Mm -hmm. Somebody who's really in a developmental window where verbal risk is very appropriate. Okay. Okay. And they're, I mean, they're just little sponges. They're just taking everything in. And so I'm going to set up a scenario. A scenario is that you're walking with your, with your small, (laughs) your small person Mm -hmm. down the street and you hear a dog barking and he's going to turn over and he's going to look at you and he's, and you can see in his face, he's questioning and he says, da, 
And you say, and you, as the primary caregiver, the attentive primary caregiver, are going to take that language that you just heard him say, and you're going to do what's called an educational talk, an education ease as scaffold. You're going to build on that. So you're going to say, yes, that's a dog. You heard that dog barking. So you're taking that word that he was just attempting, and mm-hmm. you're building language around it. Okay. Okay. And so that's how there's, it creates this, the, that's, it does two things. You're both scaffolding language and you're creating what's called in communication as a serve and return pattern. He served it to you. You return it. He's going to, so you volley back and forth. Okay. So all of that goes away. The minute you put a screen in front of the kid. Yeah. Because the distraction is so great that not only they're having to filter out the outside sounds because the visual stimuli will win. Okay. Mm-hmm. So we're doing that. We're to, and we're removing that, those talking opportunities in grocery stores, in strollers, in car rides. We're removing all of those every time we put a screen in front of the child. And what's happening is you're missing these developmental windows of, like I called it earlier, appropriate verbal Mm risk-taking. And so they'll get to a point where they start just holding back and withholding. And what you're creating is a silent child. Mm. And so, wow. yeah, so you, and then you, the older you get, you know, the scarier risk taking occur, uh, the, right. scar- the scarier risk taking becomes. So we really want to give our kids, their toddlers, we want to provide them with as much opportunity to try and fail at language as possible. And that simply does not happen with a screen. Mm, that's so good. So do you support, uh, <laughs> any sort of, you know, I think about the moms who say, I, the car, you know, long car ride, we, it's just easier and calmer if we put a movie on. I mean, is that, or is that something that you feel like falls still into a category of um, too much screen time for a child? Or are you thinking about the driving around town, you know, and still having the, the screen on at all times? Or is there somewhere in between that feels like the kind of the sweet spot? Right. Okay. So, I have to tell you that we are all travelers on this road. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) There is no shame in whatever anybody is doing to get through the day. (laughs) And that being said, it's my recommendation that you reserve the screen time use for those long car rides. Just like I have absolutely no desire. I live in Los Angeles area. I have no desire to fly to New York City without watching a movie <laughs> a movie ever again, <laughs> you know? Yeah. But yeah. now if I'm just flying from LA to San Francisco, I might just bring a magazine, yeah. you know? Yeah. So I think, I think parents can easily moderate that. I feel like they can get a good feel. My concern is that when a child habituates to a screen so so much in a vehicle that it's yeah. expected. Now I'm, I'm a little bit older than you and my kids are 12 and 16, mm-hmm. which means I have a new driver Yes, and you just follow that dotted line down the yes, road there. When you scary. see, when you have somebody who's habituated to a screen in a moving vehicle and you have a new driver, I mean, good yeah, luck. That's it's scary. yeah. You just, you, you that's what, as you move th- forward through your parenting, journey you just always kind of have to keep that scope and sequence in mind Mm -hmm. where you're you're looking at the end and going what am I building to in allowing this what am I building and I mean if you're taking a road trip oh by all means I mean but but have other activities in the car as well absolutely I think that's great and I think that's good for the audience to kind of understand that healthy screen habits as an organization. And I think as a term does not mean 
no screen time at all. Not it's, at all. It's thinking Not at about all. how we can best use what's available to us. Exactly. In a way. Yeah. Oh, because yeah. who doesn't want to use it? It's fantastic. Right. Right. Well, yeah. that's that's the rule that we have. But with our minivan, because it's relatively new and it's the, really the first time that we've ever had an, an entertainment system in a vehicle. And our boys know that if we're essentially driving more than about an hour and a half, you know, kind of long enough for one movie, then uh-huh. we will put a movie on and they'll get to watch it. But uh, we make them take breaks in between movies if it's a longer road trip. And the problem that we found is once you put a movie in, that's all they want to do. <laughs> so we've really kind of had to learn how to set the expectations in the car, you know, that, OK, you can watch one movie and then we're going to take a break. We're going to maybe eat some snacks, take a nap, uh, sing some songs. Right. But we are not just going to put in one movie after another, but it's tempting. You know, it's, it's easy to be like, all right, next movie in. But they just become such little zombies back there and then they get cranky and it just kind of becomes a bad c- scenario. Oh, but yeah. And what you see screens. In- Oh, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, and what, you know, depending on what they're watching, they become, they, the, they get hyper stimulated. Yes. And so then <laughs> they have, if they're locked into a car right. seat or if they're locked into a car, they have no way to burn it off. Yes. Right. So yes. that's when you start seeing this total flare and backseat battles where it's like, oh my gosh. So we got, you know, an hour and a half of quiet, but now is it worth? Right. So everybody's losing their minds in the back seat. So yes. 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 So, so true. yeah. So I recommend saying, you know, when, you're putting together your when you're looking at your road trip when you're looking at your drive obviously there are going to be things that come up that you cannot control you don't know what traffic's going to be like you don't know whatever but you might be able depending on the age of them like you say you've got a six-year-old yeah I mean you might be able to say when we get to such and such Mm -hmm. then we'll watch a movie after that but you yeah they I mean the the concept of time is very difficult for them to understand at that age so yeah. it's so you kind of have to give them physical markers, you yeah, know. That's so helpful. That is yeah. so helpful. I so, got to tell you the best tool I ever had on a road trip though in the back mm-hmm. seat was a roll of painter's tape. I mean, they oh, use it to build what a great roads. Idea. <laughs> you can customize stickers, you can I mean, yeah, if you've got somebody who's working on their alphabet, I you can love have them. It. Oh, oh, they oh sell it goodness. by like the sleeve at Home Depot. <laughs> that just, is fantastic. Oh, what a great idea. Oh, thank you. And it'll come <laughs> off of anything that it's exactly. stuck to. Exactly. That's why that. it, that's why it has to be the painter's tape. <laughs> yes. I love that. What a great idea. That's a great tip. Thank you. So, So we've kind of talked about the young preschool and elementary age and the impacts that too much screen time can have on that age. And so let's talk now about the preteen and and teenage years. And I think the thing that is probably one of the most scary things about screen time to parents of kids that age, which is... The, their potential exposure, not necessarily on purpose, but accidental to salacious content. And so how can parents who have kids who are maybe in middle school and they are on their own a little bit more, but they still have access potentially to the internet and the things that are out there, how can parents have those conversations with their kids and help reduce their kids' risk of exposure? Okay, so when you're talking about salacious content on the internet, you need to know that it is not, it is absolutely not a matter of if, it is a matter of when. And so you honestly, if you are not comfortable having those conversations with your kid and talking about what to do, teaching them what to do when they see it, Mm -hmm. then, then honestly question whether or not you are ready to hand over this technology Mm, to your child. Because I mean, the, the rate at which the content is uploaded and the, I mean, 
the average expo at this at this point the average rate of exposure to, and and again like you said it's early accidental exposure to pornography is between the ages of of eight and eleven. Oh my goodness. Okay. When you talk to child development experts, what they recommend doing is beginning conversation around material that is going to be kind of tricky and stuff like this. You want to start about three years in advance. Oh so my goodness. So you're now talking for me. <laughs> yeah, 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 you're talking kindergarten. You're talking now there's a great book out there written by Kristen Jensen. She started the group Protect Young Minds and it's called Good Pictures versus Bad Pictures. Okay. She wrote one for preschool, which is good person good pictures versus bad pictures junior and then there's a little bit of an older picture book and there are also other books out there and you can look under scholastic that have great um uh great explanations of brain development Mm -hmm. that kind of help your child start to think about their brain as something that they need to take care of and nourish just like we take care of our bodies our growing bodies need you know nutritious food and just like that we also need to challenge our growing brains by doing hard things and by recognizing what's not what's not healthy for us. And so those kinds of images are not healthy images. So you need to teach your child when you see something like that, when you see, and it's going to vary child to child, whether it's talk, whatever the content may be, you know, I mean, whether it's just a scary picture of something or whether it's, you know, much more graphic, they need to be able to turn it off or to shut it down tell a trusted adult and then do something active. And you really, you really want to get them doing something active after they've been exposed Mm -hmm. because it doesn't allow the brain to perseverate and to go around and around and around on those images. Okay. So this, this gets into the like neurobiology of learning because neurons that, that fire together, wire together and you really want to keep it like moving, moving, moving. Okay. And like challenge them in a different way so that they're, they can keep keep moving. So that being said, we're talking, we're talking about tweens and teens now though, we're not talking about little guys. So tweens and teens are well aware of the content that's out there generally. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, they're often more well aware than most, most parents. Uh, and there's just a host of filtering and monitoring services that you could subscribe to if you like. There's also I mean, there are, when you go on to your settings, if whether you use Apple, pro, um, Apple products or Androids, mm-hmm. that you can go into your settings and go into it in Apple, it's screen time in Android, it's digital life and you can set up it's, but this is just like your first layer of filter. I mean, it's just, your very, very basic. Yeah. Okay. But at least it gives you something, right? Absolutely. And just like in YouTube, you want to go in and well, one thing you please just go in and turn off the autoplay on YouTube mm. and, and you can go into your Netflix account and turn off the autoplay and that will allow you to have control over yeah, the stopping really point. Yes because otherwise you know it I mean otherwise it just it keeps going and it keeps going and I'm sorry but I'm not I'm not attentive enough to keep it, my eye on my watch to know, okay, I need to stop it in seven minutes. Right. So it, <laughs> it kind of brings it back to more like the old school TV by, by doing it that way. And in teaching your teens and tweens about the importance of knowing how much is enough, yes. you know? Yeah. So, so as far as like being exposed to that type of content, you definitely, definitely want to create a culture and a, you know, a framework of understanding within your family mm-hmm. and not have it be shame based. There's uh there's a group called Fight the New Drug that has a whole 
just a ton of information out there for people who, if you're, if you're actually dealing with pornography addiction within your own family or with, or with someone, you know, and it's just a, I mean, it's a wealth of information because it is clearly a growing problem. Mm -hmm. And the biggest, yeah, the biggest, the biggest thing to be concerned and aware of with children being exposed to to the salacious content online is that we are seeing just so we're, you know, we're a social species by nature. We learn by watching and then by trying. So very innocently, we're having a generation of children who are growing up being exposed to images that, that they're then turning and trying out on guess who friends, siblings, mm-hmm. etc. So the rate of child on child sex abuse is soaring. Mm. So that's, that's well, it's, I, I, I don't, I don't want to terrify you. I want to, <laughs> I want to just make you aware so that you can teach your boys. Yeah, and yeah. you know, like when you see this type of, of stuff, this is, this is what you do. You turn it off, you tell you know, tell a trusted adult and you can go over who's a trusted adult and then you need to get active or go outside or go find the dog or, you know. Well, I think it's so important that what you said in the beginning that they need to be able to know what to do because it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. Yes. And so knowing that you as the parent have kind of empowered them to know how to deal with it, I think is really important. One thing that I've heard some parents say kind of in response to the need to have these early conversations is, well, I don't want to plant the seed of curiosity with my kid, you know, and and them be curious kind of in a negative way about what this is I'm referring to and maybe go looking for it. So have it sounds to me like the research says that, empowering them in this way, the, the benefits outweigh any risk of that. Side yes. Of things. I think, I think that anytime you can impart information and you're doing it in a calm way, mm-hmm. you're not being a reactive parent at that point. Right. Who's freaking out over yeah. what did I just walk in on? Yeah. You know, I mean, you're, when you can come from a calm, a place of calm mm-hmm. and just, and talk about it and say, look, this is out there and you will be running into it. And it's no different than getting your you know, than talking about cigarettes or vaping or yeah. alcohol. So yes, we have to teach that we have to teach our children a, a host of, of things, uh, but you know, about, about Lots what to dangerous. look out for. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. But I'm not, I mean, I think the curiosity comes from the unknown yeah. in a way. Yeah. I think that in addressing it, you're removing the mystery yeah, of that's it. That's so helpful. That's great. So as we start to wrap up, and I feel like you have just imparted so much incredible wisdom uh, for us. Oh, you are so sweet. This has been so fantastic. So as we wrap up, if there's a parent out there who feels a little overwhelmed by kind of, okay, now I have a lot of work to do, a lot of conversations I need to have, but maybe I can just start today with a couple of things to create a healthier screen habits type of environment in my home. What are a couple of things that a mom can implement today. In okay. Her home. Absolutely. Today, what you can do is you can sit down and you can decide. And I have to tell you now with your youngers, it's going to be easier to just enforce a house rule. Right. You <laughs> know, rule. here we are. Right. Yes. Yeah. With the olders, with the tweens and teens, what you're going to want to do is have conversation around yeah. it. Yeah. And you're going to want to start by, you know, the more you can get your child's kind of fingerprints on the blueprint of the Mm -hmm. plan, the more they will buy into it. And I mean, I think that's true with most adults (laughs) moving forward when they, you know, like I said, we're raising this generation of critical thinkers. They want to, they want, they're much more convinced if they know why this is in place. And so one of the things you want to absolutely establish is that there's no, is what are the tech free spaces in your house? Okay. Okay. What are the tech-free rooms? And 
please keep the technology out of your child's bedroom. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, we're seeing just, uh, I mean, there are two things, A, that predators need to and to, you know, be successful, and that's accessibility and vulnerability. Yeah. And so remove that from by keeping the tech out of your child's bedrooms. And it will also protect their sleep habits, which were, I mean, the more we find out about sleep, the more it's like, oh my gosh, this is really sacred time that we have to protect. Mm -hmm. So you want to, and so no screens behind in bathrooms. I, I say no screens in intimate spaces, bedrooms bathrooms and you know closed doors so you want to you want to create that you want to also create tech free times and in by saying that what I mean is you want to establish like is dinner time a tech free time for your family mm -hmm. because you really want to just kind of go back to really visiting the objective of why are we sitting here together yeah you know, yeah. I mean, and you, you, again, you, you never want to have the implicit message to your child being that the device is more important than the relationships in the room. So the, if you, if you do the tech free times that works very well, because then at some point you don't have to have the argument of, well, we're in a restaurant, so we're not at the dinner table. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so you could it transfers. So you want the tech free times. We also, um, encourage families to establish a family docking station for mm -hmm. device for kids who already have devices. And that this, this seems as though it goes against what I just said about keeping tech out of the bedrooms, but that I do encourage you to keep in the master bedroom. It simply, um, keep it away from your bed so that your sleep is protected. Yeah. You know, you've, you've done enough sleepless nights as a parent already, exactly. you don't, <laughs> but you do want all devices to be turned in and it discourages sneaking and behavior that, that you're, you're kind of, you're kind of like just putting candy right out in front of, of someone if they if they know that because some people say oh we charge our devices in the hall outside their bedroom and I can turn and then talk to those teens and they're like oh yeah like no as soon as my parents go to bed I just I grab it <laughs> yeah exactly I mean and I go I know what I would have done at 15 yeah, exactly. of course <laughs> I mean <laughs> so so those are some things that you can do and um you know establish what what we call like a tech parking lot when you come in the house so that you're not walking around in the house with your technology on you. Mm -hmm. So in my house, it looks like we've got a console table just right inside to the left of the door and you can just leave your phone there. You're welcome to go and check it if you need to, but let's not, let's not have the habit of being you know, being subject to every notification, to every buzz that goes off. Yeah. And just walking around looking at phones yes. instead of at each other. So yes, yeah, yes. And just and equally, you know, just as we're kind of like, you cannot, you cannot expect success in these measures if you take the technology away and fail to employ other things. So mm -hmm have other things available. And mm. this is very hard because often it does not look like a clean house anymore yeah. <laughs> necessarily where, I you wouldn't know, know what that is anyway. I have two little boys. I don't know what a clean house is. Yes. But good for you because that means you're a, you're like, you're allowing lots of room for exploration oh, yeah. and yeah. play and all of those really, really important things in our house. You know, my guys are a little bit older. We've got a whole trunk that is full of art materials that you know my daughter at any time has spread out all over the kitchen and I've got we always have a jigsaw puzzle going so there are things that you know I mean indoor activities as well as outdoor so it's all part of that like I said that filling that reservoir of self which is so critical so that they know how to self-soothe and self-comfort when things get tricky later on and they'll know oh I know like oh I'm feeling so anxious I've got a test coming up I better go for a run 
Yeah. Or I better, and I mean, stuff that we know as adults, we have these coping mechanisms where I know, oh, I'm kind of sad today. I'm feeling kind of lonely and nothing perks me up better than like getting some coffee dates on the calendar with mm-hmm. friends or putting together some, you know, couples date nights or whatever. But I, I just, I know this about me as I need to have stuff on the calendar to look forward to, yeah. but that's only come as a result of kind of, you know, figuring myself out and not being distracted and doing it. So yeah. we have to provide these opportunities for our kids to be able to figure themselves out too. Those are fantastic tips. I'm so oh. grateful for, I feel like we can can go and start implementing these things today, even with little kids. You know, it's not like I need to go round up a lot of smartphones from teenagers, but those who have teenagers certainly can start doing that. And uh, I think there's, there's some exciting things that we can start to implement. So remind us as we wrap up where folks can find out more and what they can look for on the website in terms of resources. Oh, great. Sure. Okay. So you can find us at www.healthyscreenhabits.org. That's our website. And on our website, we share resources and tools. And I mean, there's a variety. There's uh, there's even handouts I've, uh, that are like five reasons why kindergartners need limits on screen time that has gone out in kindergarten classes oh, at back to school great. night and you know, things along those lines. And please, Please, please share them. I mean, we would love to spread the messages far and wide. Yes, um, yeah. And on, uh, you can follow us on Instagram at Healthy Screen Habits, as well as Facebook, on which is Healthy Screen Habits as Fantastic. well. So. Well. Thank you to the group of moms who are uh, leaning in together to this and doing this work in such uncharted territory. In well, terms thank of you, parenting. Melissa, so, for giving us a voice. <laughs> absolutely. And I'm grateful for everything that you've shared. And I know that this is going to be such a great resource for the audience of Influential Motherhood. And um, I hope that we can continue to maybe uh, talk and revisit the I work would that you love all are doing to. and maybe have you back on as as this trend continues to grow and change because technology is moving to. so fast. Exactly. So. That's the thing is it's always exciting because it's never dull. It's never dull. <laughs> That's exactly there's, right. There's always the next app that, I mean, what, like, you know, several years back, nobody even heard of Snapchat. And now it's like, what is this? I know, and then I know. the whole, you know, like the whole Visco girl thing that's just taken the country by oh storm of this. I know. So there's so much to be aware of it's it's never boring (laughs) well we will uh, keep up with the work that you all are doing and and hopefully schedule another episode to learn more about some of these changes that are happening so thank you again hillary and thank you link to all the um the books and what websites that you mentioned in the show notes for those who might be driving in the car thanks wonderful thank you I'm so thankful for the moms who share their stories on here on the show and in our fun Instagram community. I'd love for you to connect with me online at Influential Motherhood on Instagram and Facebook to continue the conversation or just say hello. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave a five-star rating and a written review in the Apple Podcast app. It's how you can help get the show in front of moms looking for episodes just like this one. I hope you'll find a way to influence your work or community for good this week. Don't forget, you can listen to other episodes or learn more about the show at www.influentialmotherhood.com. See you next week. 